probably the happiest days of my life are days when I, when I have a book and I don't know of any errors in the book. Yet. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and and uh, it's it's especially uh, important to me today because uh, this book is about my life's work. I mean, uh, um, if somebody would ask me what I what I thought I you know I I, I maybe do best and and uh, have spent most time on. I would say it's something that I've always liked to call the analysis of algorithms, and this book um, uh, takes 30, or it takes about uh, three dozen papers that I wrote about the subject over the over the last 40 years, and um, and then I got a chance to um, uh, to go over them all again and fix them, uh, and, uh, and also make it so that uh, you know take out embarrassing things like when I use a sexist pronoun. Uh, or something like that, and uh, so so with all the you know all the formulas, I could type in the left hand side and the right hand side to a computer, and now we can e evaluate it and check that the formula is right, and I could fix the ones that were wrong, and I could, and also at the end of, of most of the papers, I added um, uh, you know uh, something to bring them up to date or uh, um, or, or, or supplementary material that uh, um, that I thought would be interesting, and um, so. Uh, uh, anyway, I'm happy about this, and I hope I hope some of you like it too. It's got a beautiful cover, and uh, of course you can't tell a book by its cover. But I do want to show you um, uh, the back cover. Can you zoom in on that, uh, Lance? Can, uh, I just want to see how good the zoom is here, it, because I've, dedica <laughs> I've dedicated this book to Professor De Bruyne, uh, N. G. De Bruyne, or Dick De Bruyne, those of you who know him, uh, in the Netherlands, because he has been my my guru, uh, the person who, uh, uh, ever, you know, ever since I got my PhD, I considered him my my postgraduate doctoral advisor. Every time I had a problem that I that I got stuck on, I would write to him, and he would send me back a letter. It would help me get unstuck, and that's been going on for almost 40 years now. So I dedicated this book to him, and uh, uh, and and what I want to talk to you about today is one of the things that he has spent most of his life on, asymptotic methods. Um, first, I'll show you the table of contents. Um, uh, the first paper is the, is the paper that I gave at the International Congress of Computer Science in 1971. That was that was uh, you know one of these one-hour addresses uh, where I sort of, where, where you sort of get a chance to talk about your life's work, and that's where I sort of thrust it up thrust this topic on the world, and my wife, at the, at, uh, on the occasion of that conference in, uh, Lub in uh, Ljubljana, it's now uh, called Slovenia country, um, uh, she made this, uh, this nice title for my slides, and uh, I've always liked it, so I've had this uh, up in my office uh, at Stanford all, all these years, and uh, I even uh, now uh, on the web you can download the postscript file that way. <laughs> That will that will give you that will give you that and I, and she also made another you know another slide for me that tells why I like analysis of algorithms um, and a few others uh, that she made for me that I've lost uh, but these are these are anyway I got ahead of, thought I'd show you those today I probably should have put them in this book maybe next next printing will do that <clears throat> first error okay um, <laughs> uh, um, the second chapter is goes the other way and says um, and says how dangerous computer science theory can be. Um, and uh, uh, well, the first one says how, how wonderful it can be, and so on. It, it, it covered lots of different uh, lots of different topics, and uh, some of them are highly technical. Uh, others are, are, are more formal, are, are less formal, and uh, and uh, uh, a lot of them are about average case studies of how well computer methods work on average. Uh, others are about the worst case and, and the complexity theory of all methods to solve a problem. How good could they possibly be? Uh, the, at the end of these papers are mostly about complexity. And, and uh, something of interest to those of you studying computer science now might be uh, chapters 28 and 29, which was when uh, when the subject, we, what we call now P, uh, NP problems, NP hard problems, and so on, when, when that terminology was invented. And uh, it, it includes... Uh, uh, comments of uh, of many people at the time uh, when we were wrestling, we're coming, to, trying to come to the grips of what should we call this this topic that looks like it's going to be pretty pretty uh, uh, rich. And uh, anyway, that's the uh, that's the the general uh, outline of the book. And uh, I, I want to talk today mostly about um, 
supplementary material that I did for Chapter 21. It's a paper I wrote in the 70s with Arnold Schoenhage, uh who's now at the University of Bonn. And uh, it was uh, one of the... And, and we, we saw <coughs> a, a problem um, about a... Uh, well, we call it the equivalence algorithm. Now, nowadays, it's most, more often known as the union find problem. Uh, the question of uh, if you're given if, if you're given uh, pairs of elements that are supposed to be equivalent to each other, uh, can you tell whether or not uh, uh, two others are are equivalent uh, as, by a chain of, of of the elementary equivalences that you've been given? Um, it's also the same as saying are, are two things in the same component of a, of a graph if you know the if you're given the edges of the graph, so um, uh, that and we showed that if you take a if you take a, a very simple algorithm for the problem and if you, if your data comes in at random, uh, the average running time is going to be um, at worst proportional to the to the uh, number of points that you that you're considering the equivalence of. Uh, but we didn't know that uh, the constant of proportionality. Now is is Steve Simon here? He said he was going to come. Uh, maybe uh, he's, he's, maybe the traffic is bad. He's a professor at Hayward. But after we wrote our paper, uh, let me see, chapter 21. I want to get to. Okay. So after we wrote our paper, um, uh, much uh, uh, really nice uh, uh, extension of our results w was done by Steve Simon who, uh, and 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 Bela Bulabas at uh, at, at uh, Cambridge University. Um, and they published their paper in the Siam Journal of Computing, 1993, uh, where they identified. You know, we uh, Arnold and I had proved that the con that this is is a uh, 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 linear time on the average, but they found what the constant was. Uh, so they nailed the constant as being the, as being this. You know, c is is um, uh, is the sum of of these terms, and I'll talk about these terms more in a minute. Um, now. Uh, so that was a great result, but it also put me into a little bit of a dilemma for the consistency of my book, because all, all, every time I, I refer to a fundamental constant in my books, I've always um, tried to evaluate that constant to 40 decimals. Uh, so, for example, if you look at the art of computer programming and you look at the, you know, in the, in, in the back of the book, um, uh, tables of fundamental constants, uh, here you have uh, square root of 2 to 40 decimals. Uh, square root of three, you know, e pi, Euler's constant, log of pi, things like that. All, I, I give it to 40 decimals. I didn't have room for, you know, for 50. This is a nine-point type to be room, but you know, on a regular page, you didn't have room for more. So anyway, this was about, and I, I calculated a lot of these in the 60s. But ever since I, it, it, ever since that day, uh, whenever I had a new constant, I, I uh, you know, it wouldn't feel right to have it at 10 places or something if it was a fundamental constant. In fact, uh, this, in, this. Uh, uh, this turned out to be uh, uh, scientifically important to, to have constants to, to many places at least three times in my life. Um, one time, for example, I, I was working on um, I, I was working on, on the problem of factorization. It's, 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 it's one of these other chapters in the book here, and I and I and I uh, 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 was trying to calculate the. Uh, uh, the average size of the largest prime factor of a, of a random number. If you take if you take a number, you know, about a hundred digit number, and and then you want to say about how many digits are there going to be in its in its largest prime factor, and you can find you can you can find the uh, the average length of it, and it'd be about 62 digits. And uh, let's see, I have an example. Where is that um, analysis of a simple factorization? Well, that's the previous chapter. So that's uh, so I can so for example, if you look at uh, at the numbers, um, uh, where are we here? Uh, yeah. So, so if if you look at um, uh, at at the, for example, hundred largest ten-digit numbers, um, uh, these would, and, and you can say how many fact. No, this is prime number of prime factors. I wanted to say how 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 large are their prime factors. Anyway, it turned out that. Uh, uh, this this constant 0.62 was the average number, but I was also I also in the course of this work calculated another constant um, uh, that I needed uh, as I was I was doing a numerical integral associated with it, 
And I, I looked, and I, and I, and I, we had computed this constant by some long, very hairy uh, numerical integration involving additive formula, and we got, uh, uh, it came out to 1.78107 something or other. And, and um, uh, two weeks later, I happened to be in the library looking, looking up uh, in a completely different problem, and I was looking at a paper by Rosser and Schoenfeld that was about prime number, and, and they had a constant in there that and I had a feeling of deja vu. You know, 1.78107. Have I seen that somewhere before? And and uh, so I, I I went to my office. That, uh, you know, I wrote down the constant. I came back to my office and I looked, and sure enough, um, uh, that was the constant that we had calculated by this long numerical process. But but the thing was that Roth and Trumpel didn't call it. You know, they call it e to the gamma. So so uh, so I thought, oh my goodness. Could it be e to the? I better check it because they only they only gave you know we, they only gave the constant to to uh, five or six decimals, and so I and, and so I, I remember my excitement. I, I I ran to a telephone so so that in those days that was you had to you had to go through a modem in order to connect to MIT in order to compute uh, uh, on a maximum program at MIT, and so so I could log in over there you know and the phone wasn't working and uh, you know. And so, I, so, so finally, I got connected to MIT, and I and I said, okay, now I'm going to calculate e to the gamma. So I so I turned to the so I turned to the tables of, of numerical quantities in my book, uh, so I could look up gamma, and I could type in the value of gamma, and I find out, oh, there's e to the gamma too. <laughs> yeah. and, and 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 the, the and it agreed to 15 decimals with our with, with our result, and then it disagreed in the 16th decimal. And so I said, "Now wait a minute. You know, would, would God create a universe in which in, in which uh, there could be two constants that you know arise naturally and and would, and would agree to, to 15 decimals? Or, or would God be able to create such a universe?" <laughs> and and, and um, uh, so uh, but so so we checked our, our our program and we just couldn't find any error in it whatsoever. But uh, uh, but finally it, it, uh, it uh, we realized that uh, we had used a, a numerical method that. Uh, that depended on continuity of the fifth derivative, and and this function would, had only four derivatives, and it was discontinued. Um, uh, you know, but so so this was the first time that I learned that that doing high precision calculations can can help you. First of all, it helped me discover a whole connection, because once I knew it was e to the gamma, that that meant a whole new kind of mathematics must be connected with this problem. And then I started seeing other things uh, uh, pouring on it uh, uh, again. Uh, uh, the other thing is this constant 0.62. It turned out we had uh, uh, that was difficult to evaluate, and we had one of our grad students, uh, Bill Mitchell, who uh, uh, was a student here in the 60s, um, and he, he evaluated it uh, to 40 decimals for me so that I could put it in my book. And and it turned out that uh, that we found out later that in the journal Math of Computation, in the following year, some some. Um, uh, some number theorist uh, evaluated another constant, uh, also to you know 30 some decimals, uh, in connection with uh, uh, in, in connection with this prime factorization problem. The, as far as I knew, the constant uh, that I asked Mitchell to, to do was was for the size of the largest cycle in a random permutation. Um, and so, if you have per permutation of 100 elements uh, and and on you know, this random permutation, what's the longest um, cycle? And it turned out to be about 62 long, and uh, and so uh, uh, in, in the same journal, uh, one year apart, uh, uh, the same constant had been evaluated, but they didn't know it. Uh, in fact, it had gone through a whole different chain of editors, and and it wasn't until I uh, I wrote my paper on factorization 10 years later that we looked back and found out that these were the same constants. Uh, and so and there's another case then where, where knowing a constant high precision. First gives you a conjecture, and then later on we can see the mathematics uh, comes on. Now the, th the third story I'll tell you quickly arose with, uh, with the calculation of greatest common divisors, and Richard Brent um, uh, had had worked out a theory for what we call the binary algorithm for greatest common divisor, and uh, and in the uh, in, in the previous edition of my book uh, I had quoted his his. Uh, 12-digit uh, value of, of, of the fundamental constant that arises in that analysis, and it was here, uh, 0.70597. And, I, and I, I wrote to Richard and said, look, look I, I've got uh, this is the only constant I don't know to 40 decimals. Can, can, you, you, know, can you possibly uh, uh, calculate it further? Because he's got all these supercomputers in Australia where he, could, where he could work. 
And uh, there was another constant, too, here, point, uh, 0.39. So we have these constants now. But, but uh, uh, so, so while he was, but I didn't, I didn't get any answer from him, so I said, well, okay, I better try doing it myself. And so I looked at his paper, and, I, and he, he had given two methods to evaluate this, this constant in his, in his paper. Uh, one, one method, um, well, well there, were, there were two completely different methods, uh, uh, and they both gave the same answer to 12 digits, so he was pretty confident of the, uh, of the thing. So I, so, so, uh, uh, so, so I started to use one of his methods, which was based on power series, and I evaluated uh, uh, lots of constants, and, and, I, and I worked, uh, uh, you know, for a couple of weeks and got lots of digits, and I got this answer. Um, and here, uh, again, we were disagreeing, but this time in about the 14th decimal place. And from his from his results in mind, we were only up to 30 digits at the time. But but uh, uh, but but uh, here we we thought there must be a bug in uh, you know we, we started uh, the people at at Wolfram Research in in Illinois were, were going to uh, uh, to help us check to make sure that uh, you know we were we were going to we were going to check every step of the way to make to find out where, what kind of a discrepancy could happen. And finally, uh, uh, it, uh, uh, it turned out that. Uh, that uh, we both noticed on the same day independently um, uh, a, a mathematical error that Richard had made in the 70s in his paper, and uh, he, had, he had neglected a, a, a tiny little term that affects only the, the 14th, you know, it has no effect until you get to the 14th decimal. So his, his, so, so his mathematical formula for one, for one of the two cases w gave, in fact, a different result than the formula in the other one. It's very similar to the to the, the, the story of when Hardy and Ramanujan were studying the prime number theorem, uh, Ramanujan had a formula that he thought was correct, and there was, but there was some little wobbles, some little wave effects that that, that, that have a very small uh, thing, which which finally uh, Hardy and and, and Ramanujan uh, uh, did when they, uh, uh, you know noticed when they when they published their rigorous proof. So so. Uh, 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 Finally, uh, Richard, with massive computation, was able to calculate these constants to to, to uh, 40 decimals, and uh, uh, I was getting another digit every two days from him in, in email. Um, and uh, st and then uh, um, uh, Brigitte Vallée in in, uh, in 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 Cannes in in France uh, uh, was working on on a really wonderful theory of this uh, of this problem, and and she uh, has the best results by far in it now and she and, and she has this conjecture that the two constants that i showed you actually are related one over the other is t twice log of 2 over pi square and that is, is still a conjecture but we know that it holds to uh, more than 40 decimals now okay. so that's why i'm i'm kind of interested in in in, in having numbers to to many, to uh, not to many places but uh, uh, but uh, so so here i had this constant now and i thought okay i better evaluate it but I looked at the at the con at, at and so let's can we zoom up on this uh, as close as you can, Lance? So here's it's pretty hairy formula. I have to sum this from from one to infinity, uh, and it's one over m minus this hairy summation, which involves fact, you know factorials in two ways and huge numbers uh, that are sort of supposed to cancel out, and that should cancel with the one over m, and uh, and uh, it turned out that t t sub m is is of order one over m to the three halves power. So, so we're summing some, so, so, you know, I, I can certainly evaluate this for small m, uh, you know, m up to a thousand or something like that, uh, and exactly, uh, it's not, no, no big sweat now on a computer to, to, uh, uh, to work with, with rational numbers, and I could add up uh, uh, t sub m up to a ways. But um, if I have uh, t sub m is, is proportional to m to the minus three halves, that means that the that the that, that the sum uh, a, a remainder after after n terms is going to go like one over square root of n. So even after I've done a million terms, I've only got three digits of accuracy. Um, now um, in their paper, uh, Bolabash and Simon s um, gave a value for this constant to, to six decimals. Um, and I say, well, wait a minute. How are, how are you? How are we able to figure that? You must have known. You, know, you must have. You, you must have used some other tricks that weren't in your paper. So I call up Steve. It, Steve, are you here yet? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hi. So you can check me out. You can verify this. Uh, well, stand up anyway. We'll get you on on on, on camera. So. The, <laughs> 
Uh, they, they, the TV man didn't get you, but that's, well, you can pose later. Anyway, so the, the, what I remember you telling me on the phone was that you had, you had worked on, uh, uh, for, for a couple of years on, uh, with computers on, at three different universities uh, to, to, get, to get this value, and you talked to a lot of numerical analysis and, uh, analysts, and they said, uh, well, you, you know, we have certain acceleration uh, uh, methods, but, uh, but, but uh, it wasn't, uh, but it was kind of a, 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 a real uh, adventure to get six decimals. Uh, is, is that a fair summary? Of, uh, oh. uh, I talked to one American analyst at Cambridge, and, okay. uh, and he tried uh, uh, some acceleration methods which did not work. I mean, it did not converge. Oh, oh, okay, so 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 so, so one American analyst at Cambridge had 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 uh, given advice. On, yeah. So, but I had uh, I uh, didn't have too much uh, uh, confidence um, in the uh, in that I would ever be able to, to get it to 40 decimals. But uh, but it was but it was a fun challenge, and um, in fact that was that's part of the, the, the you know the uh, the thrill of the chase was 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 sort of there. I wanted to I wanted to say could there you know I I was supposed to know something about this kind of formula. So so, so was it possible that I could that I could get somewhere with it? But also I I, I I didn't really believe that your six digits were correct. You know I thought probably you know it's maybe five. You know. But uh, uh, but I but uh, you know I was going to at least uh, I, I wanted to to at least verify. Uh, uh, that it was correct before I put it in the book. Uh, uh, so, so I started looking at the problem. And today I want to show, in the rest of the time, uh, uh, some of the, you know, some of what went on. Uh, I can't give you all, all the, you know, if you're really interested in the details, it's it's uh, it's actually uh, nine page, ten page addendum to, to to chapter 21 in the book. But uh, but I want to I want to. Summarize the highlights, the general, the, uh, the general principle. I'm going to talk about seven general principles that that, that help in, in in asymptotic problems that I that I found uh, uh, useful in this particular in this particular case. Uh, so so now I know, first I'm I've got to simplify this formula a little bit. Um, if if you look at the at the very end here, it has this factor one over one plus delta k m. Now delta is it just just means that. If k is equal to m, it, this factor is one half. Otherwise, the factor is one. It's a complication and it messes up the formula. So I'm just going to forget that. I'm going to leave off the last term. Uh, uh, we can always that's one, it's only one term. I can add it back in later. So I'm going to only sum um, for, from k one to m minus one, and then I then I get rid of that factor. But we still got some factorials in there. Um, uh, but um, but anyway, uh, I can work on this sum. Because uh, you know the the m the, uh, it's a sum on k that has k to the k minus one over k factorial k plus m minus two factorial divided by k plus m to the k plus m minus one. I, I'm showing you from a piece of paper now. I could I I, could, I guess I could really use the the, the real book uh, to to do this, but it's the same of course in the book because I hope because the paper was my proof for the book. Um, all right, now, uh, so, so principle number one that we use on this problem is um, uh, good old Euler's summation formula. Uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a simple idea for how to convert a sum to an integral. Uh, that then the integral gives the first approximation, and then you also know the error between the integral and the sum. And you can carry and, and you can carry that usually uh, a lot further and get and get better and better corrections uh, and uh, to evaluate the sum. So uh, one of the and this is described of course in in, in uh, lots of books including my own and and uh, one of the most uh, famous results of that is is Sterling's approximation for a factorial, which is obtained by Euler's summation formula. So uh, it, uh, people learn in uh, high school that n factorial is is asymptotic to n to the n over e to the n times square root of 2 pi n. And then there's other corrections if you want to go into f further details. So after you've got this first, this first part of Sterling's approximation, then, then you've got other, uh, other terms that go on 1 over 12 n, 1 over 288 n squared, minus, and so, uh, minus uh, 139, so on. Um, and the coefficients that are, uh, I'm going to call it sigma sub j, Sigma zero, sigma one, sigma two. The, the constants in this in this approximation. Um, I, I guess sigma, because you know, is sort of s for Sterling. But uh, 
but uh, uh, they, they come from a formal power series that uh, if you take the exponential of something involving Bernoulli numbers, you get this, uh, and then you, you get the series of, uh, which defines all, this, all the constant sigma. And it has, it has a nice property that, um, uh, uh, that also um, 1 over n factorial uh, will be um, uh, e to the n over n to the n square root of 2 pi n. And then the rest of it goes 1 minus 1 over 12 n plus 1, 288 n squared plus all, all the odd numbered coefficients change sign, but the same, the same sigmas occur in the, in the uh, asymptotics of, of uh, 1 over n factorial as in the asymptotics of n factorial. Um, uh, and the reason is that, uh, obvious from this uh, power series, because if you, because it has only odd powers of z in it, and and and, uh, and so if we take the uh, uh, reciprocal, uh, everything just get, just changes uh, uh, st from z to minus z. Um, now, um, uh, I, I should mention that this this series, uh, you know, I, I have dot 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 in here, but it's asymptotic. It's it's not really equals. Um, it's asymptotic because it doesn't converge for any value of n. These these sigmas eventually start oscillating and growing so that so that the, the series diverges. You, if, if I if I take n equals a million, these these terms will get smaller and smaller and smaller for a while, and then they get, they come to a, a point where of diminishing returns where they start uh, they start the, uh, uh, diverging and going all over the place. Uh, so it doesn't so so it gives you a a, a good uh, clue about the size of one of, of, of one over n factorial, but it doesn't give you uh, the uh, 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 any you know infinite number of decimal places. It only gives you a certain number based on how big n is. Um, but that's asymptotic. Now, um, and and uh, step one was to use uh, Stirling's approximation. Uh, so then I could take my sum S SM that I that I had, and I could rewrite it. Um, uh, instead of having a k plus m minus 2 factorial, I, I, it was simpler to say k plus m factorial, uh, and then divide by k plus m and k plus m minus 1. And, and so I get, uh, uh, by simple transformations, I, I get it into the form of a sum of, of other sums involving a constant tau sub j, which are the, are the sum of the first j sigmas. Now, in order to get this second formula, I used another principle. So, so first, I used order summation formula in order to get the uh, uh, to get Stirling's approximation, say. And then the second principle here was uh, what I like to call uh, thinking big, which means if you're looking at a if, if you're trying to figure out how this w sum behaves when m is a big number, you try to imagine that m is is really huge. Uh, you don't think of m as being 100, but you think of m as being uh, 100 to the 100th or something, you know, Google. And, and then you would say, well, this, but k, you know, you know, uh, uh, may, may, you know, maybe k isn't so big, so k plus m, uh, k plus uh, some huge number, uh, it's better to, uh, to factor out that, that as a square root of m. So I take a square root of m out of this, and I make this 1 plus k over m uh, in the square root. And, uh, and similarly, I with the denominator, and I get some uh, some formula of this form. And the, and the larger, uh, and and so I so by thinking big, uh, it suggests the transformations that I made to put it into this form. And so instead of evaluating my my the sum S M, which I needed for my original problem, I've got it reduced now to a sum of 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 other problems, which one ha which involves one half minus J. Uh, uh, which I'll call beta. Uh, so I have to evaluate a, a bunch of other sums for various values of beta. Beta equals uh, one half, three halves, five halves, seven halves, and so on. Um, uh, yeah, let's see, because J starts at one. So, so um, uh, you know, mathematics tries to take one problem that you can't solve and replace it by Another one that you might be able to solve, uh, or, or a bunch of other problems that you might be able to solve. And here I've replaced it by an infinite sequence of problems of the same of, of this form, which are, are are looking simpler than the one I the one I had because there's no factorials left in here, just uh, it's just powers and stuff. Now, um, 
but, but now what next? Well, the next thing is to apply, uh, well, uh, is, is I have to look at De Bruyne's book on asymptotics because it, I was stumped. I had no, no idea what to do. And so De Bruyne has a chapter on, well, you, what do you do if you have a sum that, that you want to get the asymptotic value of? And he says, well, there, there are four cases. There's case, case A, case B, and case C, which are pretty easy. And then there's case D, where, where, where those don't apply. And this turned out to be in case D. But he had a good idea in case D. He didn't give it a, a particular name. Uh, it was his case D, but, I'll, but I think uh, we could call it um, uh, uh, break off an approximation, or, or break, break off, well, whatever, break off an approximation. Uh, so in other words, it, um, you have, a, you, you have a, something that you don't know what to do with, but you subtract an approximation uh, and then you try to tr try to deal with the um, with the degree of approximation. Uh, it, this is a little bit related to a method that I that I uh, uh, that Laplace invented, which we called trading tails. But it isn't the, it isn't the same method. So so what we're going to do here is actually we're going to take our our unknown sum S M of beta, which I'm just going to call S uh, S M. Uh, well, let, let's let, let me let me. Uh, uh, give it in, a sketch of it. S M of beta is is um, is a sum from one to m minus one of something that involves beta. Uh, you know, there's a minus beta in here. Um, and now, uh, but I don't know how to deal with that one. Uh, but uh, but uh, um, I, I I can call that S. Um, but I can try adding this. I, I can try instead to go for the sum all the way to infinity. Which, which we could call s plus s prime. Uh, the, you know, add, add, add the other terms because maybe they aren't going to they aren't going to going to make a, a, a heck of a lot of difference. Uh, you know, if, if I if I kept k going uh, further and further, but maybe they will. Um, and then, um, uh, but now I uh, so, but now I have an approximation to s. Uh, the, the individual terms of, of s here uh, it was k to the k minus one e to the minus k over k factorial. I did have a factorial left in there. Um, uh, now uh, I know one over k factorial is is approximately uh, uh, something t you know k factorial is like k to the k so so this is uh, l this looks like k to the minus three halves power divided by square root of two pi times the sum of these uh, these sigma uh, this is Stirling's approximation again so if I if I if I subtract off Stirling's approximation up to a certain degree l here uh, then I've got um, you know, I've got a, I've got something that that I that's maybe easy, easier to deal with. So I'll call that a that I'm subtracting off, and so I have a so so so, so I um, so I have pm of beta, which is going to be the sum from one to infinity of these terms minus the approximation. So 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 p is going to equal s plus s prime the whole thing minus a minus a prime, which is the approximation up to m minus one and the approximation for m up to infinity. And then I have to correct that. I, to get down to S again, I, um, I also have to add in QM of beta, which is um, uh, which I call um, uh, A plus A prime. This is the sum, this is the approximation um, uh, that we had. So, so my QM is this approximation uh, based on Stirling's formula. Um, but it, it's, it's something that I can probably sum up to infinity. And, and then I had to also, though, uh, put, put another RM, which is A prime, which is the approximation, uh, uh, you know, for the large term. And I can add that all together. And what do I get? So I take this, you know, so, so I take this plus this minus this, and uh, I'm left with S uh, plus S prime minus a prime. Um, and now I just have to show that this is very small. So if, if I've got a good approximation, if, 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 the, if, if my approximation is, is good, which uh, in fact it is, because uh, if, we, if we turn the page, we'll see that, uh, uh, that the approximation I've made here of k to the k minus 1 e to the minus k over k factorial minus the, minus the Stirling's approximation to it is good to k to the minus l minus 5 halves, where l is the number of terms uh, that I took in, in, in Stirling's approximation. And so that's, 
that's uh, on order k to a minus big power. And I, if I sum that all the way um, uh, from m to infinity, uh, that's the, the error is only m to the minus uh, l minus 3 halves. So, so this is going to be the, uh, uh, point 3. I break off an approximation, and, uh, and I've replaced my original problem of SM by three problems, P, Q, and R. Uh, and P plus Q minus R is not equal to S, but it's equal to S plus something very small. Uh, good, good enough that I'll be that it that it uh, that, you know that it goes to zero to a high power of m. Uh, so that's uh, that was part three in this in this uh, uh, in, in this game of trying to uh, analyze this this uh, this constant. Well, now um, P, Q, and R are, 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 are left, and uh, and R was the one I knew how to, knew I could handle. And R works again with uh, with order summation formula. Um, uh, order summation formula works best when you have a w w when you're trying to do a sum something like this. Um, I have a sum from m to infinity of a function of k over m. Uh, so so this, the index of summation uh, 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 so k over m sort of goes from one to infinity. In, and in this case, f of x was a particular was a particular function uh, that I could uh, 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 you know that's not too bad x to the minus 5 has. This, this is an example of different values of beta give, give you different uh, powers in here. Uh, now, uh, 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 so order summation formula says, well, you want to figure out how, big, how, uh, how uh, a sum is looking like asymptotically. What you do is you first uh, you, you replace it by the integral, and you have other terms. And order summation formula actually gives you uh, the uh, 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 an expression of f in terms of, of in terms of the derivatives of f, um, uh, then with powers of m in the denominator. Uh, except that when n is zero in this formula, it's not the derivative of f; it's the integral of f, because that would be f to the minus first derivative, which is the integral. Um, but that, but uh, uh, but basically, it, it gives a, it gives an asymptotic series. So I take uh, more and more terms. Uh, and I, I get uh, more, more or better and better uh, error of approximation of big O of m to uh, uh, to the minus l, where l is is as, as big as I want to I want to choose. So so that was uh, uh, going back to principle one again, and, and uh, it enables us to uh, check off r as uh, as a solved problem. Now I have to do q is another is another problem, and for here we use a technique. Called Mellon transform, which is um, invented by uh, Yalmar Mellon. I see. I think he was Finnish mathematician in the 19th century. Um, and uh, I'd never heard about this transform when I was getting into math education. I guess I, it was just one of these things that uh, that my teachers never got to. But but uh, it wasn't used. Uh, 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 it, it, well, now we see it as as wonderful. But I first heard about it from uh, uh, from De Bruyne when I sent him a problem. I was trying to analyze a, a sorting method called radix exchange sorting in the 60s, and I and I had gotten some empirical results that were that, that so I so I had a good conjecture as to what the answer was going to be, but I had no idea how to prove it. And and he said, well, why don't you try uh, why don't you try this? And it turned out that what he was telling me was basically uh, a Mellon transform, uh, a subject that he doesn't discuss in his book on on asymptotic. Um, but in my when I then I, when I uh, I found other ways to use this method over the next few years and and uh, then uh, uh, other people realized oh yeah this is Mellon transform that you can find in in um, integral table books and and uh, and now it's been developed into a really powerful method especially by Philippe Flageolet and and his co colleagues at INRIA in France um, and. Uh, uh, but in, in my, when I first uh, knew about it from De Bruyne, I and, and I put it into volume three uh, in in uh, early 70s. Uh, I, we call it the gamma function method because it would it uh, you know it, it was the way that got the uh, uh, this gamma function into our formulas, and um, and uh, well um, uh, I can give you a quick summary of what it is, but I I want now to evaluate the sum. Of f of k over m as we had before, but not from m to infinity, 
like I did with Euler's summation formula, but from one to infinity. And I want to get a good expression for the for the, for, for the sum in this range. And uh, the idea is that you use the Mellon transform f star of s, which is defined to be the integral of f of x times x to the s minus one. S is a parameter, so we start with a, a function of x, and we get a and we get its transform, which is a function of s. It's something like a Laplace transform. And and uh, so, well, in this case, you you evaluate it, and it turns out to be a beta function. It turns out to be gamma of of this time, you know, a quote, uh, quotient of some gamma functions here, uh, provided that s is a complex number whose real part lies between five halves and four. Um, uh, this is all uh, uh, not too hard to check. Um, and then, uh, uh, then you use analytic continuation on this complex function uh, to make to say, well, this would also be true then, not only for the, the, the things where we where we ve where we ver verified it, but also uh, uh, by analytic continuation, it's it's true for all complex values of s. Now, um, uh, uh, complex analysis was something that I, I'm really glad that I had uh, in my junior year in in uh, college. I, uh, uh, I I I think it's absolutely the, the most important. Mathematics I ever learned, and I I insisted that my daughter uh, take a course in complex analysis, even though she wasn't doing any science at Brown University, because you know <laughs> because complex analysis is so important. So so uh, uh, anyway, this is uh, uh, just one another example of, of how how, uh, uh, how how the 19th century mathematics has unreasonably affected uh, to 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 uh, 20, 20th and 21st century problems. Uh, so anyway, now uh, I wanted to evaluate this function, uh, uh, you know, 1 over x to the 5 halves, 1 over x, 1 plus x to 3 halves. So I wanted to get a good asymptotic exp uh, expansion of this thing from 1 to infinity. And what you do is you, then you, you can get the inverse Mellon transform. And, the in, and if, you know, if you know f star of s, you can get f of x back from it. And, and the formula is you integrate 1 over 2 pi i times the integral over some straight line c minus i infinity to c plus i infinity and you, you integrate um, um, f star of s times x to the minus s d s and so plugging in x equal k over m and then summing gives you a formula for this sum in terms of uh, an integral because I could carry out the sum the sum inside the integral sign and, it, and I gave, got a zeta function in here the sum of 1 over k to the s power is, by definition, Riemann zeta function. So here I've got a, fo a formula uh, that I used to think was am am amazing that, uh, that it would arise at all. I mean, I, I have gamma function three times and zeta function one. Uh, but now um, I see it so often, I think, well, yeah, you, you know, this is just another case where, where we've got ga gamma functions and zeta functions occurring. These, were, these, to me, in my education, were something that, you know, only number theorists cared about. And, uh, I uh, was here. I'm using it in a, in a problem on um, on um, union find algorithm for goodness sake. Uh, so so um, uh, if c is is any num is any real number between five halves and four, uh, this this derivation was valid, and I can get an asymptotic series by uh, by moving the c to the left. And, and but taking the poles of the integra of, of, of the integrand uh, into account, and so 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 that gives that gives an asymptotic series, uh, which turns out to, uh, uh, to to be it involved the zeta function at negative values. So you know zeta of, of uh, five halves, zeta of three halves, zeta of one half, um, where where th th this is the the extension of of this complex valued function usually defined only for for uh, values that are that are po that are uh, real part is positive, but uh, uh, it's also well known what their values are negative. So this is the answer. Then uh, uh, turns out to the to the Q problem. Uh, you, uh, you, the Mellon transform give, gave the answer for the Q problem. It had only P to, to go. Um, so what would, question? Sign yep. and then an equal sign. What happened? Uh, because uh, uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> well, the right hand side is equal to the thing above it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, okay, but yeah, I am not claiming that equal to that. 
Thank you, Percy. You saved me two dollars and fifty-six cents. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, I don't know how many days will go by before I find the first mistake in this book. But uh, but yeah, this is uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if this converges. Uh, the zeta function of minus five halves. I can't remember this. This com complicated transformation. To, I don't know how fast it grows. Um, it might or might not be. That probably it probably doesn't converge. But um, uh, I'm not claiming that it does. But it looks like looks like I am. So maybe I should put a I, I should put that in there. But it is equal, uh, which is a sort of a stronger statement, even though the series might not be correct. <laughs> So, uh, hmm, that's that's a good point. The point is, look, what? Hypography, hypography makes it look like the sum of it, the uh, upper left is equal to that. Well, if I had a less than sign, you wouldn't you wouldn't say that. <laughs> uh, um, but um, uh, okay, well we, we'll have to hash that out later. Now, um, uh, so anyway, that solves the Q problem, and. Uh, and uh, now the P, the P was the was the one that was really you know so so now I was really hooked on this. I mean I had the I had R and Q figured out and I still hadn't got the answer to my constant. And uh, of course the, I have nothing if I can't if, if it reduces it to a problem that I can't solve. Um, uh, but uh, but here uh, uh, um, uh, we come to our fifth principle for asymptotics, and and that is uh, luck. Uh, sometimes, sometimes you have to be lucky. Now, uh, this is, is, you know, as I said, some. Uh, but if you're working on a problem that has a reasonable mathematical structure, it isn't inconceivable that it will relate to some other problem that's been studied before. Um, and as we and as we saw, the the gamma function and the zeta function, which came up in completely different contexts, now turn out to be just what I needed for the, for, for 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 part of this problem. Um, well, one of the 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 uh, um, so. So there's something called the unreasonable effectiveness of 19th century mathematics that almost all of the problems that that uh, that arise uh, uh, that have some uh, you know some cleanliness to them, if we can solve them at all, uh, the, the mathematics was already worked out for us more than 100 years ago. But with one exception, there is one function that was that was almost not studied at all during the 19th century, but turned out to be very important um, uh, in in uh, computer science, and now we've, we're learning more and more about it all the time. And this is the tree function, which I've already talked about a couple other lectures in this series. Um, and it's it's uh, it's equal to the sum of k to the k minus one uh, over k factorial times z to the k, um, and it satisfies it z t of z is equal to z times e to the t of z. And then you can iterate this and go on and up and uh, 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 get an ex exponential of an exponential and, and things like this. Now, this, stu this function was studied a little bit by uh, uh, Eisenstein in, in 1850, but very, very limited extent. So this is, uh, this is w the, one, the one function of all the ones that I've become to know and love that, 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 that more of a 20th century thing than a, than a, um, a 19th century thing. And, uh, uh, but I, but I've been running into it over and over again. When I'm, you know, I first ran into it, the very first algorithm I, I tried to analyze uh, satisfactorily was was hashing, and I ran into the, uh, uh, things like this. Would so, so I keep coming into it all the time. Uh, it's the generating function for uh, uh, rooted labeled trees. Uh, if, if you, because there's k to the k minus one labeled trees with uh, uh, with k points. Now. Um, that's why I call it the tree function. So, so here, um, uh, uh, P, what, this function p that I that I'm worried about um, uh, is uh, uh, this k to the k e to the minus k part is just t of one over e. And then I have then the other part I can sum. Um, you know, first I, I I'm summing all the way up to infinity. Actually, I, I'm, I'm going to cut it back to to, to m, but I'm, but uh, but the other part is is just a sum of re, of uh, reciprocal powers of k to the j, so that involves a a, a zeta function. Um, now, um, uh, but the the uh, uh, value of t um, of one over e is easy to figure out because of this uh, uh, functional relation that t satisfies. So t of one over e is one. And and this is in fact the uh, radius of convergence of this series. Uh, when z is is one over e. 
uh, t equals 1, and if it, z gets bigger than 1 over e, the series diverges. Now, um, uh, so uh, the, one of the first things I had to do was, uh, was uh, evaluate this sum, and it turned out to be 1 minus uh, something in data functions that we could just compute. Uh, but I also have to uh, uh, consider uh, not k to the k plus k minus 1 here, but k to the k plus n minus 1, where the thing gets a lot, you know, gets more complicated. Um, and um, uh, so, for example, when n is 3, I have to take this sum, k to the k plus 2 e to the minus k over k factorial. Now, that's approximately, uh, well, let's see, k factorial is like k to the k, uh, uh, and and so um, and the square root of k in there. So this is approximately k to the three halves power. So I have to subtract off three uh, 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 terms of Stirling's approximation in order to get this down to something that'll converge. Um, and then I take off then the next from 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 j equals three up to l. I continue on, but I take I have to take out the first three terms here in order to get something that that will converge. And so now I have to figure out what's the value of this constant. If I can, if I can work out the value of this constant, then, I, then, then, I'm, then I'm done. Um, uh, so uh, uh, now I use uh, 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 the standard summation method to get the value of this constant. I say, well, this is the limit as epsilon goes to zero of e to the of e to the uh, minus epsilon times times the whole thing. Uh, I multiply the whole thing by e to the minus epsilon. And I let epsilon go to zero. Uh, in order to uh, uh, in order to, in order to get the, the limit, because if I put an e to the minus epsilon in here, I can I can relate this to the tree function. Um, and in fact, I use Mellon transform again um, to get uh, uh, to get this part of it. Uh, in other words, I, I I'd like to figure out w what is a sum like this e to the minus epsilon k divided by, or times k three halves uh, uh, sum that over k. What does that look like? Uh, uh, as a function of epsilon, and uh, use use Mellon, arg Mellon transform argument and gives you the answer. Uh, uh, we're running short of time, so uh, you can always look look it up. But now I get get to some, something that's that, that's quite that's that's, that's quite uh, important. I think uh, the integral the operator that's usually as in tech it's called var theta, which is so you, you take the derivative and you multiply by z. You, you, you don't only differentiate, but then you multiply by the variable again. And what this does is, in a power series, it multiplies the coefficient by the power. So if you have z to the n, uh, you differentiate, and you get n times z to the n minus 1. But you multiply by z again, and you get z, z, n times z to the n. So, so, uh, so theta is this nice thing that, that, that uh, if, if I take theta cubed of, of a function, I've multiplied its coefficients by, it, the coefficient of z to the n by n cubed, which is what I, what I had, to, had in here. So now this theta operation is actually, it, it, we, it, it's so nice we could have been taught it in high school instead of, in, instead, of um, in, instead of derivatives. I mean, like theta of, applied to fg is equal to f theta g plus g theta f. Um, you know, theta applied to uh, f to the, to the uh, x is equal to x times, times theta of f times f to the x minus 1. It's uh, the, same, the same kind of rules for, for uh, in the chain rule doesn't work quite well. But, but the, uh, uh, the most beautiful thing about theta is the, um, is the analog of Taylor, se Taylor series. And here's a formula that I, uh, I wish I had been taught early in life because I use it now a lot. So and that is that f of s times e to the t is equal to the sum of t to the n over n factorial theta n of f of s. Um, and let's like, now, it, if, if instead of theta here, I had, I had the derivative, this would say, um, uh, this would say, for example, f of s plus t f prime of s plus t squared over 2 f double prime of s and second derivative, third derivative, this would be Taylor series. But instead of using differentiation, use this theta instead. And then you get the expansion of not f of s plus t, but f of s times e to the t, which is f of s times 1 plus t plus t squared over 2 and so on. And this formula is so, uh, it is so neat for working around saddle points and things like this. So, so anyway, this is a, this is a formula that I want to uh, uh, 
in, in fact, uh, then there's also, if, 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 you know, there, there's, there, there's a formula with remainder that's shown here in the book uh, uh, that if you, if you only look at the first few terms, then, then you get a, an explicit formula for, for what the remainder is. And so, so you know uh, the quality of approximation that you get. And so uh, what it turns out is then uh, the following. Um, I study the tree function, which, is, which I had been doing it, uh, uh, by, by luck uh, in other problems, and, uh, and, I, and I'm interested in, in knowing what, is, what does t look like uh, not at, e, at 1 over e, but, but near 1 over e. So that's it, the value of t of e, e to the minus 1 minus epsilon, where epsilon is some positive number. Instead of, instead of writing a positive number in here, it turns out the formulas turn out to be a little simpler if we replace epsilon by um, w squared, in fact, w squared over 2, um, where w is some real number, because then this is guaranteed to be positive. So, so, so now I, I say, well, this is going to be a little less than 1, so, so, so let me make this substitution. t of e to the minus w squared over 2 minus 1 is 1 minus v. Uh, then uh, we can expand uh, by the, uh, by the uh, um, using the fact that t of z is z times e to the t of z, and we can uh, determine uh, that we get this formula, w squared over 2 is equal to v squared over 2 plus v cubed over 3, v fourth over 4. That's why I chose the things like it did. So I can now uh, take the square root of this equation and, I, and, and solve for v in terms of w, and we get this, uh, this, this sequence of, uh, of uh, constants that's easy to do now just with one command on a computer, say revert this series. And we get the ver uh, various coefficients here. And now I, I uh, set w equal to square root of 2 epsilon, and I, and I find out uh, the behavior of t to the e to the epsilon minus 1. And also, I can also uh, uh, figure the sa similar thing when, when this theta operation has been applied to it. So I, so I, get a uh, so I can see exactly how, the, how this t tree function is behaving in the neighborhood of 1 over e. Uh, by this uh, by this means, and um, uh, well, uh, this this all turned out to be uh, uh, you know it it, it it took me two or three days, uh, but it was exciting times because I was getting these these interesting num these interesting numbers coming in here, and in fact um, um, there, there's a, uh, a a beautiful result that that uh, uh, it was amazing after I because because another a deja vu happened all over again uh, in this uh, in this study and that is as I'm as I'm looking at uh, at, at the at, at this at this expansion of, of, of uh, tree function of e to the minus t minus 1 uh, uh, and I try to solve my problem of what are the p it turns out that uh, I'm getting uh, a certain constant c sub n which is which is right here in this in this tree function and the, and, and the number c sub n are, are shown at the bottom here now, these are, these are numbers that I, I had seen before many, many times in other problems. In fact, it was in R Ramanujan's first technical pub publication. He solved the problem about half of the exponential series and it involved these, these constants. And, um, and so there has to be a reason for, for, for why this is true. And that's what, uh, that's what this part of, the, of, of my book is, is, uh, is devoted to, to explaining. And, in fact, uh, uh, Cecil Rousseau uh, 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 found a, uh, uh, a, a, a very interesting connection related to this when he's st studying a random mappings. Um, and uh, so it turns out then that uh, uh, the coefficient of t to the k over 2 in this thing, when k is odd, uh, is, is in fact also, the sigmas that we're starting out from Stirling's approximation. So this formula coming from the, and I never knew this before, but coming from the tree function, um, and, and you look at the, at the expansion of this reverse series here, um, uh, and you look at the odd numbered places in there and multiply by the right factorial, and you get uh, Stirling's approximation, the, the constants of Stirling's approximation. Wow. In fact, that's the kind of thing that, uh, that, 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 that keeps, me, keeps me going. Even though I said I retired and I'm not going to do mathematics anymore, I'm just going to write up other people's stuff. Uh, when, I, when you start seeing patterns like that, you just have to, have to look at it a little, little closer. So, 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 I, so I, And so I was doing this as a tribute to, to, De, Bruyne's to, to De Bruyne. It's not to his memory. He's very healthy, and I, 
Uh, we, we, you know, when the books arrived last week, uh, uh, he got the first copy of the book, of course. Uh, we shipped it off to him. So, um, so now, uh, the, the, the point is then that in this expansion here, you see this, this 139 that occurs in the numerator there? That's a strange prime number. Well, that was also, um, um, when, I, when I first gave the table of, of, of the sigmas for Stirling's approximation, there's that 139. And that was a dead giveaway that something was connected. And if you see the number 139, think again. Uh, uh, okay. Well, now, well, um, uh, that was principle number five. Having some luck and and, uh, and, and combining with the other thing, uh, then uh, principle number six was use computer algebra. Uh, that, that the main problem with doing asymptotics in the old days was that uh, you would make mistakes. Uh, and it would get, you know, in order to, in order to get more than two places of, of accuracy in asymptotic calculation, uh, you had to fill many, many pages of, uh, uh, of paper, and uh, chances that 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 that, you, that you'd gotten it all correct were were, were 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 getting smaller and smaller all the all the way through, and it was boring, not that much fun. The fun part is seeing these numbers and getting them, you know, uh, to work out. So here we got computer algebra in there, and. And uh, so, so I now get to, to get the, the answer. I had that S is equal to P plus Q minus R. And I have to add this up for all the different values of beta, a big matrix of things, massive cap cancellation occurring here and there. Uh, and then I have to sum the S's to, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, because cause those are the T's. And we had to sum the T's in order to get the constant. But putting it all together, I got the value of the S uh, in, as an asymptotic series here, and you'll notice that I did have an equal sign here, uh, Joe, um, um, but I put dot, 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 so maybe that's my cop-out, you know, I should do, do in the other place here. Um, because, in fact, I know this series does not uh, converge. Uh, the, 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 uh, a lot of these, you know, like like, like doing things, it doesn't, doesn't converge, but it's very good uh, for, uh, depending on how big M is. Um, uh, and uh, and that's the S, and then the T, uh, similarly, I get a uh, formula for T sub M. So I said T sub M was approximately of order M to the minus 3 halves power. And I have to now, so, so I've got this asymptotic formula for, for T, and I want to get the, the exact value of the sum of the T's. Well, there's an old trick that you use for that, um, uh, which is to... Uh, uh, to just uh, take the exact value up to m equals 100, and then use the asymptotic value after m equals 100, or something. Or you know, so here I, I, uh, I don't know if I used 100. Actually, I used several different values of m. That's a that's a good way to find out if you've made a terrible error if you get two different answers based on the, on the threshold between the exact and, and asymptotic. But uh, uh, ta-da! Finally, you get the value uh, to 40 decimals, and. Um, uh, uh, Steve's result was absolutely correct to six decimal places. So, so uh, uh, and uh, uh, but um, uh, but I was glad that I that I could bring this up to the same standard um, uh, as all the other constants in the book. So I said there would be seven principles of asymptotic analysis. Well, I was maybe I could stretch this a little bit, but let's just say that. Uh, the last one is rest and enjoy uh, 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 after your work because uh, you know now you can now you can tell other people about this constant. It goes on the web and and in the, that's another good reason to know things to large precision because now you you, know, you can use it for to find uh, uh, you, you know it, any any paper mathematical paper you can compute the uh, the reference to it, but if it's if it's about a sequence, you can you can uh, go for the online encyclopedia of sequences, and if it's a real number, you can, you want to say any paper been written about this number? Well, you just type in the number, and it says, oh yeah, uh, because because you know, we can use these numbers to index uh, the literature. So so uh, uh, and then you know, but then a little bit of rest, and you're ready for another problem. Okay. So that's what that's my story of, about this. Uh, uh, the joy of asymptotics, and I'm glad to answer any questions you might have. No question. Well, you have to read the book uh, <laughs> if, if you do have a question. Is the book uh, available? Is the book available? What do you, what's the story on that? Laurie? Yes. 
outside. Outside, there's, there's a table that, ha that uh, so, so he, yes, in fact, uh, sure, I got a pen here. I'll, I'll sign it for you and date it, and, and it'll, you know, you can auction it off at eBay. <laughs> yeah. Susan? Um, I would like to insist on the fact that what you said about looking up on the web, it's not just um, it's not just the joke, that is, you can't, right now, we can't, you can't look up a formula on the web because there's all different kinds of ways of typesetting it and everything. Yeah. You can look up 139 or... Uh, you can look up numbers, but formulas that uh, appear in many different guises. Yeah, that's right. In fact, I remember, remember one time when I was talking to uh, Maurice Nuva, um, uh, uh, in the, and, I, and, I, and I decided that he, that he was... Um, uh, that reminded me of French Impressionist paintings because he, he said, Don, did you ever see this formula? And he wrote it down, and there were typographic errors in both the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the formula, the way he wrote it down. But I had seen the formula before, you know, and, and, and a lot of times, you, know, you in fact, you don't even, your formula might be sort of vague, you know, you know not quite there. And, and, but information retrieval, people can do it, you know, uh, uh, but uh, but there's so, but there's no canonical form. Well, they, you know, the hypergeometric series we have, Canonical form for and and uh, and uh, this this book uh, uh, um, or what, or what's his name uh, the guy from Lockheed um, uh, it's his tables of uh, of, of series uh, Eldon Hansen uh, uh, has a, has a fairly good canonical form where you can look up a formula and and so if you if you look up Eldon Hansen's tables you know I, I have a copy I use I use it rather a lot uh, and, and so it, you know you have a formula you want to check out for a series to see if it's and he he will he will get you to the literature on on that uh, and he tells you how to you know how to find it in his table of contents um, still it it uh, it's uh, it's limited to the kind of things that 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 you can canonicalize like that. How hard is it to say what the problem, where, where this started? I mean, there was some, you said it was a union. Oh, union find uh, algorithm. So, yeah. so this is the, this is the algorithm where you, um, where, where you're given, uh, it, uh, uh, it's, it's like the connectivity problem in graphs. And it, and the constant is how, is, uh, how much work do you do in order to find, uh, uh, in order to uh, connect up the entire graph? Um, and 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 essentially, it's this: whenever you, whenever you get a new edge in the graph, you add up the size of the uh, edge between components that aren't connected. Uh, you, you you add in the size of the smallest of the two components. So if you're connecting one point to to, to a large component, you you just get one. If you're connecting two components of size 10, it's 10. If you, you know, connect, connect, uh, connecting a 10 with a 20. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's ten, and 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 it's the sum of those, uh, which is going to be then proportional to c times uh, times the total number of vertices in the graph. So so most of the time you're adding you, 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 you know you're picking up a fairly short component to the to the total. And the reason that we're interested in the smaller number is that in our data structure that we're as we're as we're merging these components together we. We say, well, whichever one is smaller, we have to do an update on all of, all of, all of our entries in the smaller one uh, to, to say that they now belong to the big one. So that was the simple algorithm that we analyzed. And that's what this constant, uh, that's what this constant 2.08477 uh, is all about. Okay, well... Uh, uh, you, you have just enough time to, to rush out and buy the first copies of this book. <laughs> <laughs>